Hi, I'm Roger Woods, minister with the Wald Lake Church of Christ. Thank you for joining me for this pre-recorded sermon for Sunday, June 18, 2023. Today we are going to be exploring the subject of our witness of Christ, what we have heard, what we have seen, uh, what we have touched, experienced, and that we are to then tell others about that as part of our Christian walk. Our scripture references for today's lesson will be coming from John, the first chapter, verses 1 through 4, and the letter of 1 John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. I encourage you to get your Bibles out and be ready to listen to, the, uh, to listen to God's Word and read it with me. We would love to see you come by and join us here at the Wald Lake Church of Christ. We meet on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. for Bible study, all ages, and then for worship. Uh, the second and third Sundays of each month is uh, Sundays that we have a special program for children during the sermon. I encourage you to bring your kids and enjoy that time uh, with, uh, with our children as together they learn in a way that's a little bit more age appropriate for them. We also have Wednesday evening Bible studies at 6.30 p.m. here at the church with a program for all children to be able to be involved with. We hope you can come and be a part of our efforts here at the Walled Lake Church of Christ to uh, be making disciples of Jesus Christ who know, love, serve, and share him with others. Uh, and in the process of doing that, wow, we receive something too. And that's what today's sermon is all about. So as we get started, let's go to God's Word and read our passages. First, or the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him, and apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. Then we read out of 1 John, the first chapter, verses 1 through 4. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, and what we have seen with our eyes, what we have observed and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. That life was revealed and we have seen it, and we testify and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. What we have seen and heard we also declare to you, so that you may also have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. You know, over the past 20 years, the analog television sets that we were so used to, the TV tube, uh, have been disappearing from American homes. They're, they're practically gone now. So many kids today only know a tube TV that I grew up on from watching old reruns from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Uh, you know, we traded those fuzzy, sometimes snowy picture quality for that crisp, picture that digital high definition TV gives us. So now instead of the fuzzy interference you used to get, your picture just disappears altogether when you lose a signal. But overall, it is an improvement. So yes, the difference is really amazing. <coughs> you know, even Hogan's Heroes, one of my favorite shows as a kid, looks better in digital. It's amazing. Why such a difference? What makes digital so much better than analog? I'm no expert, but essentially it comes down to how many lines per inch can be displayed. The more lines, the better the definition. This increases the depth of the picture, making the contrast crisp and the color vibrant. In an issue of Leadership Journal, John Ruskin writes about the importance of making our witness, our story about how Christ has interacted with us, clear. And he says this because the world sees Jesus as they observe our lives. He writes, the greatest thing a human soul ever does in the world, in this world, 
is to see something and tell what it saw in a plain way. To clearly see is poetry, prophecy, and religion all in one. Quite a statement. If this is true, then we need to strive to improve the depth and quality of our signal, so to speak, so that the image projected of Christ in us is crystal clear. High definition. Church, it's time to upgrade our spiritual lives from the equivalent of analog to the equivalent of high definition. Matter of fact, today you might even say to 4K high definition. As we listen to the readings of John 1, 1 through 4 and 1 John 1, 1 through 4, we heard this poetry, prophecy, and religion expressed beautifully. But in each, we humans have a role to play. What we have seen, what we have heard, what we have touched, experienced, we must tell to others. Had we read a few more verses on in John, the Gospel, chapter 1, to verse 8, we'd have been introduced to John the Baptist, who is intentionally introduced as not being the light, but as being a witness to the light. Now, in the first letter of John, written about 50 years later, or 50 years after the cross, excuse me, uh, John makes it clear that this bearing witness to the light of the world is still vital to the spread of the good news of salvation in Christ. Indeed, he says, it makes our joy complete. One way to become more effective is to retell your story, keeping it authentic, but making it compelling. It doesn't need to be a TED Talk, you know, those highly published short informational lectures, but it should be thought out and focused on our mission. For example, I could say that Glenda, my wife, and I got engaged over the phone. Oh, well, it's true. It's true. But it's not very interesting, is it? Hmm. Or I could say this. You know, one evening early in 1987, when I was a graduate student at Pepperdine University in California, over the Christmas break, I, I had gone back to New Jersey and I had reconnected and rekindled a relationship with a certain Miss Glenda Taylor. Well, since then, we'd been burning up the long distance telephone lines between New Jersey and California, racking up $200 long distance bills apiece. This was long before the days of unlimited cell phone plans. But on that night, the conversation had taken a different turn. And as I hung up the phone, I realized that I just proposed and she'd said yes. Now, it was midnight or after for Glenda. It was only nine-ish for me. I had to tell everyone. I even went over to the president of the university's house. I was in a small group from church and told him and his wife the good news. I was floating and with every person I told, I floated a little higher. I wanted to share my joy, whether they wanted to hear it or not. <laughs> People in love can really be obnoxious, can't they? But folks can't help but smile because they knew my joy was clearly on display. It was impossible to miss. And yes, I had a few folks try to inject some reality into my euphoria, but I was hopeless. Now, wasn't that a more interesting story? Did you feel my joy that I was feeling 36 plus years ago? Folks, if being betrothed to Christ is not filling you with joy, something's wrong. Because you see, as members of his body, the church, we are betrothed, engaged to Christ. Paul uses marriage as an illustration of the church in Ephesians 5. And Jesus is clearly the bridegroom and the church is his bride. In 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2, Paul, while addressing the church's departure from the teachings of Christ, accuses them of infidelity. I promised you to one husband, he wrote, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. Instead, they were following whatever <clears throat> itched their ears. This description of God's people being in a marriage covenant with him is not unique to the New Testament. 
Paul would have known this from the Old Testament scriptures as well. The prophets jump on this analogy often. In Ezekiel 16, this is seen in verse 8 as God talks about Israel. Later, I passed by. And when I looked at you and saw that you were old enough for love, I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your naked body. I gave you my solemn oath and entered into a covenant with you, declares the sovereign Lord, and you became mine. And now this took place at Sinai, when God covenanted not with Moses, but with the entire nation of Israel. And so in Jeremiah 31, 32, God calls himself a husband to Israel, a husband who has been scorned. Therefore, he will make a new covenant, which we know was the task that Jesus completed on the cross and by his resurrection from the dead. As we partake of the Lord's Supper each Sunday, the cup is a symbol of that new covenant in Jesus' blood. We who have been baptized into Christ have entered into a covenant with Christ, a marriage covenant. Marriage in the ancient world was vital to survival. And as changed as it has become today as an institution, it is still a desired status. We may not have found the one, but we long to know the security and intimacy of a marriage relationship. And it still fills us with joy doesn't it? I mean, what does me? And if we want to win the world for Christ, then we need to rediscover what it means to be freshly engaged to Jesus. John, when talking to the seven churches of Asia in the book of Revelation chapter 2, speaks to the church in Ephesus specifically. They had a good reputation, but they lacked something. They were lacking zeal. And the Spirit says to the church in Ephesus, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. You know, we can't fake joy. We have to rediscover that day when the love of Christ overwhelmed us and filled our lives with joy as we realized that we were saved from our sin and from eternal damnation. Back to that day when we couldn't stop telling others of the joy we'd experienced because of Christ's love for us. Did you notice the Lord said, you have forsaken the love you had at first? Some translations say, you have forsaken your first love. Just as in our earthly relationships, Uh, as it is in our earthly relationships. Our walk with God takes maintenance. To maintain that love we had at first means we have to remind ourselves, you know, not occasionally, you know, not annually, not monthly, no, not weekly, no, not daily, but constantly we must remind ourselves of his love. I heard on a talk show that the average married couple texts each other at least twice a day while away at work. How often, folks, do we intentionally check in with the Lord? Shane Hips, in his book, Flickering Pixels, describes the situation of two mutual friends. Each was the other's best man in their weddings. They talked every day on their phones. They even lived just a few blocks from each other. And yet, one of the friends came to Shane and and confided that he'd not seen his best friend in like two months. And Shane, as Shane describes it, that's more than a hundred phone calls and countless chances to hop in the car or walk a few blocks to see each other. Their friendship is withering from lack of true contact. Each person has separately lamented to me, Shane writes, that they don't feel like they know each other. It is, is it a stretch to think, he writes, that the illusion of real contact provided by the cell phone has something to do with this sad story. Technology can be a wonderful thing. It can draw us closer to one another, but it can also give us the illusion that we are connected when we aren't. If we want to return to the love we had at first, we need to see our beloved as often as we can. 
Yet many let everything and everybody else under the sun intrude on that opportunity to meet with our Lord. Now follow me on this. If Christ is the head of his church, and the church is the body of Christ, then when we meet the church, we are meeting with Christ himself. When we gather around the table, the Lord's table, he is present with us through the gathered body of Christ around us. We have in many ways become what's called Gnostic. Uh, we have separated the body from the soul. And, and the Bible doesn't do that. They're connected, vitally connected. We've said our spiritual life is separate from our physical life. Therefore, gathering together for church is not as important as at least acknowledging God. You know, church, that's not what the Bible says. That's why we're not to forsake the assembling of, of each other together. You can't find the same connection via electronic device. You can't rediscover that joy while sleeping in on Sunday or by choosing other activities over gathering with the Lord through his church. If your walk with the Lord does not include his church, then you better take a second look at who you're walking with. Now, let me say something very important. I understand that circumstances do keep us away. Health, caring for loved ones, uh, difficulties in transportation, I, I get it. Life does happen. And there are some times when we just can't make it. But let me ask you a question. Back when you were dating, did you ever come home after a long, hard day at work, shower, change your clothes, and go out on a date? Why did you do that? It was because you were in love. So folks, let's take a good look at the reasons we don't attend church and make sure that they are valid reasons and not excuses that we have slipped into because our relationship with God has grown cold and distant. We need to rediscover the passion that we had for the Lord at the beginning. For just as in marriage, along with our beloved one comes their family. When you choose Christ, you choose his church because it is his family. Oh, how many times have I heard people complain about the church? Not about, oh, Jesus is great, but the church, oh, they're terrible. You know, in the church of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we have fellowship with the Lord, Father, Son, and Spirit, and with each other. That's the way God designed it. We are known and we come to know so many others. Others who through the Lord make us and our joy complete. Remember those wedding vows, for better or for worse. We don't choose who the Lord adds to his church. We are all flawed. I like to say when people say the church is full of hypocrites, I like to say, well, come on in, you're welcome. <laughs> Be with us. None of us are perfect. All of us are striving to do better. We are flawed, but by the power of God, through his spirit, he can transform us and is transforming us, not just as individuals, but as a people, this potpourri of people that makes up the family of God. He is doing incredible things through, things that mold us and reach out to the world. That's the purpose of this family, to mold others into the image of Christ and to bring others into this fold. When we bear witness of what we have seen, heard, and touched, we are doing God's will. We are doing what God designed us to do. That's what we read in 1 John 1. 1 through 4. We do this by telling our stories. You know, I still can't believe that I got to go to Pepperdine University. 
It shouldn't have happened. But the Lord's hand was in it. Ask me sometime, I'll tell you the full version if you haven't already heard it a thousand times. But I bet you have a thousand other stories to add. And please add them. Don't hold them back from your children, from your spouse, from your brothers and sisters in Christ, your family, your friends, your neighbors. You know, it's funny. As I wrote this sermon and recalled that night that I got engaged, I can still feel the joy I had. I don't think my feet hit the pavement for a week. The joy we can find in the Lord, as much as I love my wife, and I do love you, Glenda, <laughs> pales in comparison to the joy that I find in Christ Jesus, my Lord. But if I failed to tell Glenda of my love, it would eventually damage our relationship. The story of our love and the joy of our story would fade. Church, what we have seen as we have come to know and live in Christ, what we have heard as we've listened to each other's stories through testimony and proclamation of the word, what we have touched our experience as a follower of Christ needs to be told, not just for others, and that is very important, but for ourselves, so that our zeal will not wane and grow cold. Would you pray with me? Lord God, please be with us. Renew our love. Renew our spirit. Refresh our soul, Lord, as the song says, so that we can be better witnesses for you, so that we can encourage and spur one another on to love and good works, so that we can let the world know that we serve a loving God who sent his incredible Son, our Savior, to save us, that he inhabits us through his Holy Spirit, and that all of these spiritual blessings are theirs if they will only come to you through your son, Jesus. Help us, Lord, to be faithful in our witness. Help us to be diligent in renewing our zeal day by day, reading your word, communing with you through prayer, serving you as we serve together in the church to a world, to a lost and dying world. Thank you for your love, Lord, for your son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. I want to encourage you as you live each day to truly let God's word inhabit you and then let it come out of you. In that first letter of John, uh, Jesus Christ is declared the word of life. If you're listening today and have found that you're not connected to Jesus as you once were, I want to encourage you to renew that love you had at first. I encourage you to go to a trusted brother or sister in Christ and share your struggle and desire to restore your zeal for Christ. Then you'll have a buddy, someone who can watch and encourage you. If you have forsaken your first love, don't despair. He eagerly awaits your return. Nothing you can do in this life can separate you from his love. But it is in this life that you must act. I encourage you to return to him today. Return to his family where you will be welcomed lovingly into his embrace. If you are not yet a Christian, we'd like to get a chance to introduce Christ to you. You learn of him through his, his word, the Bible. We learn there of God's love and the extent he went to to share his love with the whole world. He sent his only begotten son to save us, to die on the cross for us. He raised him from the dead so that we would have the hope of eternal life and be empowered by that life even now as we await his return. If you are ready to enter into his love, to be forgiven of your sin, and to be set on a path toward heaven, it takes simple saving faith. That is faith that is obedient to him. You've heard the word. If you believe that word, then you need to accept Jesus and turn your life away from living in sin and living for other pleasures and live for him alone. The good news is that when you do that, he gives you so much more. Then confess him as God's son before others and be baptized. Die to yourself, be buried with him in the waters of baptism, and then be raised again to live by his resurrected life. And when you do that, your joy will be complete. 
And that joy will see you through your whole life. I know it continues to see me through mine. The ups, the downs, the highs, the lows. God bless you and have a good day.